Welcome, everybody. I'm so pleased to have you here for our fall Judeo-Christian Studies public lecture. And tonight we are having the Hugh McCloskey Evans Memorial Lecture. And I'm especially excited to welcome our guest speaker, Wilfred McClay. Uh, Bill was here, it turns out, exactly on this date in 2013. And since I didn't deliberately remember that or arrange it, I think it's divine providence. So we're very grateful. Now, some of us knew Bill when he taught in the Tulane History Department, 1987 to 1999. And I'm afraid there's a general principle here. You don't realize the prestigious standing of your own colleagues until they come back as guest speakers. <laughs> so uh, Bill's latest achievement is a important new book, Land of Hope, An Invitation to the Great American Story, which I was excited to see when it came out as number one Amazon best. I was excited and envious. <laughs> number one bestseller on Amazon in history. <laughs> so, uh, we don't usually do this. We have a special treat tonight, which, for which I'm thankful to Miss Jane Wolfe, who is going to come up and tell you a plan for this book. Would you like to come up for a minute, Jane? Before I say anything to introduce Bill, let me bring Jane Wolfe up, who's been, some of you know her as a supporter of our religious studies program. And uh, go ahead, Jane. I think this is the first time you've done this, right, Ron? Yeah, this absolutely. A, I think this might be the first time that a book has been offered for free on Tulane campus. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my name is Jane, and I, I'm an alumni of, alum, uh, of Tulane. I teach world religions uh, at University of Holy Cross, actually. But I went to many, many discussions while I got educated. I just got educated uh, like eight years ago. And I always went to discussions, and it would always talk about the book or talk about things, but they would never, like, give you the book. <laughs> so I own a business in New Orleans, and um, we have started a literacy project, and we are starting to give 100 books away when you make a purchase. And uh, so when Rowan told me that a book, you know, has a book, I said, well, let's offer a book here. <laughs> so we're going to offer nine free books, and I think every... Got another one, all right, non-free books. And hopefully one day on Tulane's campus, every discussion here will be where you can get a book from the author. Well, uh, coming back to you, Jay. Yeah, come back to me. We, we need book sponsorships. That's what we need. So I, I'm going to do it real simple here. We're going to pass this around. It has 80, 80 numbers on it. Just put your name on it. And at the end, we'll pick nine people, and we'll see who wins. OK? So just pass this around. All right. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> so uh, just a few words about Bill McClay. His undergraduate education was in the Great Books Program of St. John's College. I mention that because so many of our graduate students are fellow alumni. Uh, so you have a crowd here from that. And he received his PhD in history from Johns Hopkins in 1987, at which point he joined our faculty. He holds the G.T. and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma. And this year, he's the Ronald Reagan Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. Bill's numerous public positions include membership in the National Council for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, and many others. Actually, he flew in last night, I think it was last night, from Washington, D.C., where he was delivering testimony before the U.S. Commission on Unalienable Rights at the State Department. So we're lucky we got you today. Among his valuable and influential books, one, The Masterless, Self and Society in Modern America, was selected by the Organization of American Historians as recipient of the Merle Curti Award for the best book in American intellectual history. Land of Hope, in the short time it has been out, has received numerous wonderful praises. One reader calls it, I'm quoting, history as literature, broad, detailed, compassionate, 
and it can help anyone who wants to know where we came from and how we got here, which I think we all need to know. Another reader remarks, this generous but, un but not uncritical story of our nation's history ought to be read by every American. Tonight, Bill has offered to speak on the Hebraic strain in American thought. I know we're all eager to learn more about what exactly this means, but Bill tells me he is especially interested in the 19th century writer Nathaniel Hawthorne as a representative. If there's anything to my very long ago high school memory of Hawthorne, we may be hearing of a darker thread in our heritage, perhaps not entirely unrelated to Bill's topic last time he was here. The title of the paper was The Persistence of Guilt in a Post-Religious Age. I think you're about to get a glimpse, though, of someone with an exceptionally open mind, lively curiosity, sense of humor, intellectual warmth, even I'm tempted to say cheerfulness, to open up these shadowy depths for us. So please join me in welcoming Bill McClay. It's, it's so great to be back here. And I got to say, I'm that, that Jane, I, don't, I can't see anybody, so, so I'll just be looking out at you blankly. But it, I, I'm looking forward to getting to know Jane better, having just met her now. But I got to say, it was just balm to my soul to hear her voice. That, that is a New Orleans voice. Uh, nowhere else, nowhere else in the planet will you hear that, 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 those dulcet tones. So, you know, I just savored every word. Uh, well, I could go on about how, uh, how delighted I am to be back here. And, you know, I'm afraid there is a kind of dark strain to the things I've talked about when I've come here. So, um, but this is not entirely dark, I hope. Um, it's uh, it, the, the uh, we're coming up on the semi-quincentennial, this is testing everybody's Latin, uh, the semi-quincentennial of the nation's beginning. That is the 250th anniversary, and uh, uh, it took them a long time to settle on how to sort of make, make that into uh, a phrase out of Latin. Uh, uh, and the, this is going to all be very interesting. I'm actually serving on the, the, the National Commission for the semi-quincentennial, which is why I say it so trippingly. I've gotten used to it. Uh, and, you, you know, one of the things in our meetings we talk a lot about is the question of national identity. What, what is American about America, or what makes an American an American? Uh, one of the interesting people I've read over the years on that subject is the Eric Erickson, the, the uh, great uh, uh, sort of neo-Freudian psycho psychoanalyst and cultural analyst. And he was uh, an emigre. Uh, but he was puzzled and fascinated by this question of American identity. It, it, I think he'd be utterly defeated by today's world with our globalized economy and culture and porous boundaries and, and all of that. But, uh, yeah, but he was interested in this, this question, and he said, you know, America was really a problem because, as he said, whatever one may come to consider a truly American trait can be shown to have its equally characteristic opposite. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Americans are so changeable. And, and uh, um, let me quote from him again. They may find themselves cycling in a single lifetime between such polarities as, and I quote here, open roads of immigration and jealous islands of tradition, outgoing internationalism and defiant isolationism, boisterous competition and self-effacing cooperation, and many more. So I think that all of those examples will resonate for us. And he came to the conclusion that a nation's identity was not a simple unitary thing, but a kind of series of debates uh, derived from the ways in which history has counterpointed certain opposite potentialities, the ways in which it lifts this counterpoint to a unique style of civilization. Uh, I like that formulation. I think it helps us to grasp how it could be that a country envisioned from its beginnings as the natural home of the Enlightenment, a new world, 
free of bondage to customs, traditions, and the burden of history itself. As Hegel said, the land of the future, the land of desire for all those who are weary of the historical lumber room of old Europe. How that land, that country, could be also the land where the New England Puritans settled. Uh, talk about the uh, lumber room of old Europe. Uh, consciously modeling themselves on the Israelites fleeing from Egypt for the promised land, intent on creating a millennial kingdom, a vision of tr a truly righteous nation, uh, one that had overcome the perversions as they saw it of the Catholic Church and of the failed English Reformation, and a land that would subsequently become an asylum for religious believers of all stripes, including rather fervent ones, to a far greater extent than its Europe European counterparts uh, had done. In short, the same nation that uh, the now rather antique name uh, uh, historian Henry Steele Commager uh, dubbed the Empire of Reason uh, was also the land that religious believers saw as a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, a new Zion, a new Jerusalem, a land destined for a redemptive role in the history of the world. The land of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin was also the land of Cotton Mather and Jonathan Edwards. How to explain this? Well, in some respects, the polarities are not polar at all, since the optimism of the Enlightenment and the apocalypticism of the Puritans were both premised on the belief that the world as given need no longer be taken as given, but could and should and would be made new. Even some of you may know Benjamin Franklin's seal, proposed seal for the United States, which depicts, would depict, he never produced an image of it himself, but would depict the Israelites crossing the Red Sea with, and with Pharaoh and his troops attempting to follow behind but being swamped. Uh, uh, yes, that's, that's, that's somebody in the 1850s produced that. Um, I can't remember his name, but uh, and with uh, this was part of Franklin's original design, with the the, the motto on the seal being, Re "Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God." And Thomas Jefferson really liked that. Uh, he didn't. He, he was more interested in sort of uh, the, uh, the the uh, forty days and uh, 40, 40, 40 years in the in the uh, in the desert and that kind of image. But he liked rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. But in a deeper sense, these seeming opposites that I've described recall a great opposition, uh, maybe best articulated by the church father Tertullian, uh, between Athens and Jerusalem, between Greek philosophy and biblical uh, religion, the twin poles that, as Leo Strauss argued, make Western civilization what it is. Athens stands for the free spirit of free rational inquiry undertaken in a fully intelligible world whose contours and dimensions are commensurable with our powers of intellection, of understanding. Jerusalem stands for the spirit of piety, which concedes the weakness of human understanding, the inadequacy of unaided human nature, and insists that we are utterly reliant for guidance on the few ways but definitive ways in which God has revealed himself and his will to us. And that such reliance constitutes a wisdom superior to any rationalization since God's ways are not our ways. It is by faith that we're saved, not by our knowledge. And there is, quote, nothing better than the fear of the Lord, nothing sweeter than to take heed unto the commandments of the Lord, Ecclesiastes 23. The antagonism, Strauss argued, between these two, as he called them, conflicting roots of the, of the West, the core, the nerve of the Western intellectual history, the secret of the West's vitality is the life lived, again, quoting him, between two codes, two codes that are in fundamental and unresolved tension. We would no longer be ourselves if we would become all one or all the other. A variant version of this antagonism, which I've relied on for my title, 
uh, was offered by Matthew Arnold in one of the essays collected in his famous 1869 book, Culture and Anarchy, in which Arnold proposed a contrast between Hellenism and Hebraism. Uh, he considered the two to be competing spiritual disciplines, each aiming at man's perfection or salvation. And I'll quote quite a bit here. The uppermost idea with Hellenism, he said, is to see things as they really are. The uppermost idea with Hebraism is conduct and obedience. These divergent conceptions, in turn, were rooted in divergent perceptions and experiences. And again, quoting Arnold. As Hellenism speaks of thinking clearly, seeing things in their essence and beauty as a grand and precious feat for man to achieve, so Hebraism speaks of becoming conscious of sin, awakening to a sense of sin as a feat of this kind. Hellenism celebrates man's capacity for perfection and glory in and through the exercise of his own power. Hebraism reminds him of his capacity for ignominy and shamefulness in and through the same exercise of his own powers. Neither impulse could ever succeed in driving the other away. Each enjoyed its season of dominance and its season of recession. Both had roles in the successive elements in an unfolding economy of mind and spirit. But what did Hebraism have to do with the America of the mid-19th century? There could be little doubt what impulse was dominant in the America of the 1830s and 1840s. At least the official mood of Jacksonian America was one of swaggering optimism in which the steady westward expansion of the country was matched by the booming expansion of its economy and by, by an equally irrepressible expansion in a sense of the range of human possibility. It was a time of profound religious revivalism with strong millenarian overtones widespread interest in social, radical social reforms, which almost every dimension of, of American life was entailed in, from the relic, as the Republican platform called it, of slavery, to the status of women, to the patterning of family and community life. All these things were held up to the light with an eye towards their improvement and eventual perfection. The leading literary figures of the period, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson and Walt Whitman, envisioned the ideal of the American future as a life of radical, unconditioned freedom, a romantic restoration of our lost wholeness and vitality and individuality, available to anyone with the wit and boldness to seize it. But then there was Nathaniel Hawthorne, who lived to stand athwart such hot enthusiasms and throw cold water on them. Hawthorne stalked the era's official optimism like a shadowy gray apparition, propelled by a sense of Hebraic skepticism. And he did so all the way up to the cataclysm of the Civil War. <clears throat> Just as he wrote his Blythedale Romance, 1852, as a wry put-down of the utopian dream behind the Brook Farm experiment in communal living, which he took part in, uh, so his entire body of work forms a stern and consistent rebuke to the giddy optimism of his own age and the false hopes and hidden terrors it failed to recognize. Yet he too was quintessentially American, as American as Emerson, as American as the Puritans, as American as the Salem witch tribe. At all events, Hawthorne became a distinguished representative of the Hebraic strain in American thought. Submerged, recessive, but never entirely lost during these years of antebellum optimism in American thought. His hard and challenging insights were and are all the more valuable for being wrung out of times that were so unfriendly to their expression. Such, too, would be the genius of Abraham Lincoln who, when it came time for his second inaugural address in 1865, resisted the temptation to exult in the South's defeat, but instead invoked a startlingly Hebraic conception of the Civil War's carnage as an atonement for the nation's sins, a form of absolution imposed by a just 
but inscrutable deity. Hawthorne has more than just historical interest for us now. At least that's what I intend to contend tonight. He was not only remarkably insightful in his own day, but he's remarkably prescient about certain dilemmas in our own times. Dilemmas that only the most far-sighted person of his time could have foreseen. Such at any rate is the case that I, I want to make tonight. <clears throat> In 1991, the art critic Robert Hughes, whom I greatly admired, uh, published an influential interpretation of the history of modern art. The book was called The Shock of the New. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm with you. The title recycles a shop-worn cliche, which produces laughter from people now, <laughs> because it's not very shocking by now. The really interesting story is not the shock of the new, but the shock of the old, the message of the past, often a terrible, fearful wisdom that bides its time in silence for many years in old texts and old artifacts, repressed memories, quietly biding its time, waiting for its rediscovery. This is the kind of insight, the kind of night vision, as it were, that Hawthorne specializes in. I'm going to, because I, I love to uh, place people in their biographical context, I'm going to take a little time to introduce you to this strange nocturnal beast, uh, uh, Hawthorne, who thought and lived in so many ways against the prevailing American grain. <clears throat> Conveniently, he was born in Salem. Uh, Massachusetts on the 4th of July in 1804. Um, he was a paradox from start to finish, an isolated, brooding scion of an old and rooted family who became the first literary voice of a boisterous, restless new nation. He found endless ways of embodying this tension in a life that was both very cautiously provincial and perpetually unsettled tied as it was to an England, New England homeland that he never really felt at home in, but which he could never really leave for very long, and never left mentally. He was both deeply proud of his Puritan family pedigree and deeply ashamed of it, not least by the fact that his great-grandfather, John Haythorne, uh, the W was added later, uh, had, had been one of the judges in the infamous Salem witchcraft trials of the 17th century. There was a family tradition in his family, one that formed the basis for his 1851 novel, The House of the Seven Gables, that the family house retained a curse brought upon it by the forebears' deeds. Hawthorne may, we don't know for sure, but he may well have changed the spelling of his name, partly to put a little distance between himself and his uh, illustrious forebear and that heritage. But at the same time, he never ceased to acknowledge, reflect on, even wallow in that heritage, including its ugliest elements, in ways that profoundly affected his view, not only of his own past, but of the American nation. <clears throat> his father was a sea captain who died in Dutch Suriname of yellow fever when Nathaniel was only four years old. So he grew up in an all-female house, household, with a rather eccentric and reclusive mother uh, as a major influence on him. He went off to college, skipping over quite a bit here, went off to college at Bowdoin uh, in 1821. Um, he was already by then fairly certain he did not want to pursue any of the conventional masculine careers, business, the clergy, the law, medicine. Um, instead, he was already setting his sights on being an author, and a professional writer. Uh, and those ambitions had a strongly nationalistic tinge to them at that time. He, he hoped, as he told his mother, to produce works that would be the equal of the proudest productions of the scribbling sons of John Bull. He, his, his imagery improved from there. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the years at Bowdoin were important for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's very extremely interesting, but I'm going to skip over most of it and point out the one thing that I think is useful to us. He, he, was, uh, he became friends with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, fellow classmate, and uh, 
One thing at Bowdoin, they, all the students always give the commencement speech. That's still true today. And in 1824, Longfellow was the commencement speaker. And he gave a speech entitled, Our Native Writers, in 1825. There aren't a whole lot of them. Uh, they're worth the time of day at that time. And his speech was a plea for a new literature, an American literature, quote, springing up in the shadows of our free institutions. This is a theme you see a lot uh, 12 years later in, in well, Emerson's American Scholar Address, uh, Phi Beta Kappa Address in 1837 at Harvard. This, uh, we have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe, he says. We need our own ways, our own literature, our own art that is as innovative in its way as our institutions are. Um, these <coughs> words spoke directly to Hawthorne and uh, kind of put him on a track to his, uh, his future career. But after graduating from college, he did something very peculiar. He went back to Salem and spent 10 years in virtual seclusion living in his mother's house. Um, uh, he called it his long sec seclusion. Uh, it was a time that he was incubating his talent, uh, publishing stories in here, here and there, in, usually in complete anonymity, um, and struggling with the emotional fears and loathings that a self-imposed self withdrawal from the world must have imposed on him. Others found it incompre incomprehensible that he would do this. Uh, Elizabeth Peabody, from a very important uh, uh, New England Bostonian family, said uh, he was an extraordinarily handsome man with captivating blue eyes like mountain lakes seeking to reflect the heavens. Not bad. <laughs> But, but he stayed with his mother instead. <laughs> and, but out of this tortured 10 years, uh, some of it rather mysterious, came slowly but surely a body of short fiction that would make up his first book, Twice Told Tales, 1837, same year as Amer the American Scholar Address, the work with which he finally emerged in the public eye. What little we know about those 10 years, that, he was, that long seclusion, was that he was reading. He was reading everything. He was reading Montaigne he, and Racine, Voltaire, a lot of French uh, writers, Rousseau, Wordsworth, Keats, Keats, Shelley, Byron, the poets. Uh, um, but above all, he was reading about, he was reading American history. He was reading about the annals of New England towns, Boston, Situate, Plymouth, Salem, uh, reading the papers of Thomas Hutchinson, the unfortunate, ill-fated governor of uh, Massachusetts Bay, who had to flee to England on the eve of the revolution. Sermons, tracts, Quakers, Shakers, Puritans. Uh, he, he immersed himself in this stuff, um, much of it unpublished. He later became well known, and some of you have undoubtedly heard this saying, uh, that America, the problem with being a writer in America, this was in the preface to his novel, The Marble Fawn. He said, the problem with being a writer in America is America is a country where there is no shadow, no antiquity, no mystery, no picturesque and gloomy wrong, nor anything but a commonplace prosperity in broad and simple daylight. Well, I've long been convinced that those words were ironic. Uh, and an examination of his life, I think, confirms that his immersion in the American past during those 10 years of seclusion led him to a keen awareness of his native land's shadows, mysteries, and wrongs. And these would supply him with all the literary resources he'd need. But to do so, he needed to go against the then uh, dominant narratives of American hi history, which were, broadly speaking, either religious or secular, but always uh, 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 triumphalist in character. Uh, there's a typological religious view that the, the settlement of New England was an errand into the wilderness, a divinely ordained mission to establish a pure church and a godly society to serve as an example to the world. Uh, the Protestant Reformation was seen as a great step towards the liberation of the individual, an individual conscience from the tyranny of the church, or what Thomas Jefferson liked to call monkish superstition. Uh, then this in the narrative would uh, eventuate in the American Revolution and the Republican political institutions of post-revolutionary America. 
this broad uh, progressive optimism reaches a kind of culmination in a figure like Emerson, who was Hawthorne's contemporary and friend, arguably the leading American writer of the era, sort of invented the, the job description of, of uh, freelance intellectual. Um, and his romantic individualism and near nature worship were light years removed from the moral severity of Puritanism. But its linkage to this American destiny uh, idea, uh, the promise of individual liberation, was very strong. I just, to remind you of your Emerson from 11th grade, which is probably the same year you read The Scarlet Letter, which I'm not going to talk about much tonight. Um, his first book, Nature, just a, a few passages to give you a feel for it. Um, why should we not also enjoy original relation to the universe? Why should not we have a poetry and philosophy of insight and not a tradition, a religion that's a rev of revelation to us, not a re religion of revelation to them? Uh, why should we go grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? The sun shines today also. There's more wool and flax in the fields. There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. Well, one might have thought that Hawthorne himself would be drawn to this, given his, how impressed he was by Longfellow's uh, 1825 commencement address. Um, but instead, his work from the beginning expresses a different and darker frame of mind, more powerfully drawn to the shadowy places of the past, more attuned to questions of individual and collective guilt. He was not immune to the triumphalist narrative, but he felt compelled to challenge it and complicate it. Hence, uh, I'll make this sort of bold claim here that with the aptly titled Twice Told Tales, he became our first revisionist historian, although he did so by revising in the form of imaginative literature and not a refashioning of historical accounts. Uh, and this revision had a, a strongly Hebraic uh, tone to it. This collection of tales, all, all of them previously published, included some of his best short stories, uh, including The Fountain of Youth, The Minister's Black Veil, The Maypole of Marymount, uh, and others. One could plausibly argue that Hawthorne, like Ernest Hemingway, was at his best in his early short fiction. Certainly one sees his characteristic lines of thought and vision coming into view in ways that are not much altered in his later work. And I would describe them this way, that he has a penchant for symbolism and allegory, for spooky echoes of past crimes and sins still imminent and lurking. The creepy defamiliarization of ordinary life, which seemed to hide strangeness and horror beneath its thin veneer, for static characters frozen compulsively in moral dilemmas, often self-chosen, and for a diction of word choice that conveys gauzy, dreamlike distance rather than novelistic clarity and specificity. All of these things are present in these stories. Uh, so let me make this a little bit concrete by examining several of the stories a bit more closely. One in in some depth and the others a, a little bit more passingly. And, and the story I want to analyze is young Goodman Brown, which, again, some of you may know. Um, you may not have read it quite the way I'm going to read it, but um, the title character, young Goodman Brown, is, uh, is parting at sunset from his wife, Faith, on a mysterious journey. There's a lot of sort of John Bunyan-esque uh, aspects to some of this early fiction. You know, the name Faith, Goodman Brown. No, the, the names are, you, you really don't have to work very hard at uh, unpacking them <laughs> symbolically. Um, Hawthorne intimates that young Goodman Brown is, un, is leaving on some evil purpose, unstated, and the journey takes him into the darkness of the woods, which are spooky and full of unseen terrors, very different from the woods as Emerson described them. He soon encounters an older man, with whom he had a prearranged appointment, and the two walk along together. The older man is described as a worldly man, at ease with the high and mighty, 
He carries a staff which bears the likeness of a great black snake. Hmm. Is he, we begin to wonder, a sort of diabolical figure? Maybe even a figure of the devil himself or someone in the devil's service. We're not told. After a while, young Goodman Brown begins to get tired and start to feel nervous about this thing. He wants to turn back. Maybe this was a big mistake. Uh, he says, my, my father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs. And shall I be the first of the name Brown that ever took his path and kept a great soft there? And the older man interrupts and insists on his revisionist history. Such company, thou wouldst say, observed the older man. Uh, well said, Goodman Brown. I have been well acquainted with your family, as with ever a one among the Puritans. And that's no trifle to say. And here we go, he says. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem. And it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot, kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends both, and many a pleasant walk have we had along this path and returned merrily at midnight. I would be friends with you for their sake. Well, Goodman Brown is shocked to hear all this. If it be as thou sayest, I marvel they never spoke of these things. We are a people of prayer and good works to boot and abide no such wickedness. Well, the devil, and let's call him that, is telling him some home truths about his ancestors. He's twice telling the tales. Wickedness or not, uh, said the traveler with the twisted staff. I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me. The selectmen of diverse towns made me their chairman. A majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest. The governor and I too, but these are state secrets. Now Goodman Brown continues to be shocked by these revel revelations. Uh, they meet a pious old woman on the path. She turns out to be a devotee of the devil. Eventually, he ends up at a kind of black mass ceremony in the middle of the forest uh, where there's gathered an assemblage of all the people of the village, from the most grave, reputable, and pious people, elders of the church, chaste dames and dewy virgins, to men of dissolute lives and women of spotted fame. I like that, term, spotted fame. Wretches given over to all mean and filthy vice and suspected even of horrid crimes. And then finally, a voice rings out, bring out the converts. And Goodman Brown automatically steps forward. So we see now that this was a kind of initiation. Uh, the night's event is moving towards this initiation. And then the devil-like figure gives a little speech, which I'll give you part of. This night it shall be granted to you to know their secret deed, pointing to all the people around him. How hoary-bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households. How many a woman eager for widow's weeds has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. How beardless youths have made haste to inherit their father's wealth and how fair damsels blush not, sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden and bidden me the sole guest to an infant's funeral. By the sympathy of your human hearts for sin, ye shall send out all the places, whether in church, bed, chamber, street, field, or forest where crime has been committed, and shall exult to behold the whole earth one stain of guilt, one mighty blood spot. And then it gets even worse because good Goodman Brown sees to his horror that among the initiates is Faith, his wife. Um, and then the devil gives a speech. That says, now ye are undeceived. Evil is the nature of mankind. Evil must be your only happiness. Uh, welcome to the communion of your race. And then at that moment, he kind of comes to, Goodman Brown does, as if it was a dream, as if the apparitions all vanish. Hawthorne typically, this is so aggravating, but typically, he does, we don't know that it was a dream. We don't know that this was a 
a sort of real apparition that then goes away, a sort of spiritual uh, experience. Um, then the following day, Goodman Brown is wandering, staggering around Salem in a kind of daze. He sees these people that he had seen the previous night at the Black Mass, uh, and, uh, he, and he's horrified to see them, as if just going on as if they, nothing had happened. And when he gets home, he won't speak to Faith. Uh, he goes by her without even greeting her. And we're left hanging at the end of the story. Is, was it a dream? What we do know is that Brown never recovers from this. In his whole, whole rest of his life, he's haunted by this vision of the whole earth as one great stain of guilt. Well, here's an even more happy story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Minister's Black Veil, a parable, uh, and I'll, 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 I won't be as detailed with this, but there's a, it, it's a, there's a Reverend Hooper in a little town called Milford, uh, Puritan setting, of course. He's a pious, admired clergyman. Uh, he's actually thought to have been modeled on the figure of Jonathan Edwards uh, by many critics. One day, he, Reverend Hooper starts wearing a black veil over his face. And he keeps it in place permanently. Um, it all sort of reminds me of Kafka, of something like Kafka's Metamorphosis. And, and the, there are things in, uh, in, in Hawthorne that do that. So he, uh, he was, he's engaged to be married. And obviously, that's one of the ways that critics interpret this. But in any event, whatever the reason is, the veil never budges. Um, and his fiance gives up on him. Uh, uh, and because uh, uh, he, he says, I'll never remove the veil. Um, and that does seem like a bad bet for marriage, you know, a guy who's going to wear a veil over his face all the time. So, uh, and, and at the end of the story, he gives an impassioned speech, and he says, why do you tremble at me? Why, why do I freak you out so much? Why do you tremble at me? Tremble also at each other. Uh, have men avoided me and women showed no pity as children screamed and fled only for my black veil? What but the mystery of which it obscurely typifies had made this piece of crape so awful? I look around me and lo, on every visage a black veil. In other words, his veil is a kind of mirror to them. They're all wearing a veil too. Uh, they're all gauged in, ser in serial dishonesty, self-deception, dissembling, concealment, secret sin. Uh, and that's the meaning of the parable in the title of the story. Finally, and I'll, I'll do this one even more quickly, there's, but it's a great story. My kinsman, Major Molyneux. Um, and it's this tale from the early stages of the American Revolution, and therefore closer to Hawthorne's time, and therefore a bit more revisionist history, not just of Puritanism, but of the glorious and sacred American Revolution. A young man named Robin, <laughs> who has come of age and eager to make his way in the world, goes to visit his uncle, Major Molyneux, in Boston, who is going to help him sort of make his way in the world. Well, he gets to Boston, and everything is crazy. Uh, he asks people directions, and they, they mislead him or refuse to help him. It's like a carnival atmosphere. Uh, and finally, he discovers what's going on. Whenever he asks, do you know my kinsman, Major Molyneux, people Forget it. Uh, his kinsman is in the process of being expelled. He's connected to the royal regime that is about to be, to be uh, um, expelled uh, and uh, by a mob uh, employing you know, the cruelest, most pitiless uh, form of uh, uh, expulsion, tar and feathers. So he sees his kinsman uh, in this, uh, and, and he finds himself swept up in the contagion of the crowd. He starts cheering and jeering at his kinsman. And the story ends with him kind of uh, making common cause with the revolutionaries and deciding that he's going to be able to rise in the world without the assistance of his kinsman, Major Molyneux. It's an appalling ending. It resembles the ending of Gun Goodman Brown uh, and, and the takeaway is similar. But surely this is partly a story about the American Revolution, about the American past. Hawthorne wants to remind us that the American Revolution, the central event in American history, 
glorious touchstone of national identity, none of which assertions he would deny, by the way, but was also an event ringed about with terror and torture and blood-soaked uh, brutality. He almost certainly based Major Molyneux on Thomas Hutchinson, who I mentioned before, a, uh, a loyalist and governor, lieutenant governor, uh, whose mansion was destroyed by a revolutionary mob whose savagery was matched only by its destructive thoroughness. Uh, Bernard Balin wrote a, a wonderful book about this whole episode. In presenting revolutionary Boston as a den of violent and transgressive scoundrels who would remorselessly victimize a man of dignity and standing, Hawthorne is digging down into the American past and finding materials that cast doubt on the greater narrative and the presumed virtuousness of the present. So these writings could hardly have been more opposed to the sunny, expansive, forward-looking spirit of Emerson or the spread-eagled national enthusiasm of an expanding Jacksonian America. Hawthorne was of the same milieu as Emerson, but he took a very different view of matters. He's a diagnostician of guilt. We don't necessarily in our own time bring to these stories the same sort of religious sentiment that readers in, or, or even the residue of religious sentiments that the, the, the readers of Hawthorne's time had. But there are other themes in other Hawthorne stories that may never have been as salient as they are today in our own times. And let, I'm, I'm not going to rehearse all these stories, but let me briefly describe them to you. For example, a story like The Birthmark, in which uh, a scientist insists, scientists are actually rather sinister figures in, in Hawthorne, a scientist insists on removing his beautiful wife's left cheek, uh, excuse me, removing from his beautiful wife's left cheek a tiny crimson birthmark, her sole imperfection, and of course, in the process of doing so, kills her. Um, Another story, Earth's Holocaust, in which a fire begun to rid the world of its, quote, accumulation of worn out trumpery, ends up consuming everything and leaving the world no better. Or the Celestial Railroad, in, which is based on Bunyan. Uh, the hard path of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress is replaced by an easy and convenient railway maybe a, a high-speed train uh, in, in today's uh, uh, vision, but one that leads its comfortable passengers not to the celestial city, but to hell. Or Rappuccini's daughter, a complex allegory in which a beautiful young woman, as an experiment in the control of nature by her scientist father, has been raised on a diet of poisonous plants to make herself sufficient. And she ends up being killed by her lover when he inadvertently administers to her an antidote to the poison. It's, uh, I think, understandable but disappointing to read the analysis, the critical examinations of these stories by Hawthorne scholars and see how often they miss the larger point of them and they interpret them strictly in form of biographical, sexual, or current events. Uh, templates. All of these observations may well be true or have some element of truth in them, but the readings that being put forward are essentially trivial in comparison to the profounder meanings that fairly leap off the page for all but the most distracted or insensate readers. These meanings may be the most compelling reason why I think Hawthorne deserves a fresh reading, not only by academics, and dragoon school children who had to read the Scarlet Letter in the 10th or 11th grade and never want to see Hawthorne again as long as they live, but by everyone. Um, I skipped over. I was going to talk about the Scarlet Letter, but I decided to skip over it. Uh, um, we could do that in the question period if you like. Uh, for these irony-drenched allegorical tales with their constant reversals and inversions are warnings to us warnings about the moral perils of human efforts to gain mastery over the terms of human existence. A quintessentially Hebraic insight. 
What a bitter sadness it would be, Hawthorne reflected at the end of his equally um, dour story, Earth's Holocaust, if, and I quote, man's age-long endeavor for perfection served only to render him the mockery of the evil principle from the fatal circumstance of an error at the very root of the matter. And what was that error? It was lodged in the heart. Quote, the little yet boundless sphere. All the misery of world derives from that original wrong. The human heart is where the problem is and where the only solution can be found. If we go no deeper than the intellect, and I'm quoting him here, uh, if we go no deeper than the intellect, striving with merely that feeble instrument to discern and rectify what is wrong, then the result will be no more substantial than a dream. And one is tempted to say he knew whereof he spoke. Interestingly, Hawthorne's appeal to the heart over the intellect aligns him with Emerson and with the same romanticism that was sweeping through the salons of Boston and Concord in his day. So, too, did the dreamy and gothic elements in his fiction. But if Hawthorne was partly romantic, he was also a Hebrew prophet, a throwback to the Isaiah who reviled the hardened and self-satisfied hearts of his contemporaries and prophesied how it was that the hidden things would come to the light and the pitiful wisdom of the wise would be destroyed. If he was not quite able to re-embrace the theology of his forebears in all of its details, his invocation of an original wrong, and that's his term, an original wrong, was a long and respectful bow to them and to the explanatory power of their most fundamental assertion. <clears throat> if the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, however, it is so partly because such fear protects us against the fatal presumption of mastery, a fearlessness much more to be feared than fear itself. Where then does that leave us? The progress of our scientific and technological knowledge in the West and the culture of mastery that have come along with them has worked to displace the cultural centrality of both Christianity and Judaism, the great historic religions of the West. Athens, to return to the beginning, Athens seems to have triumphed over Jerusalem, but it has not been able to replace it. For all its achievements, modern science, the spirit of Athens in our time, has left us with at least two overwhelmingly important and insoluble problems for the conduct of human life. First, modern science cannot instruct us how to live since it cannot provide us with the ordering ends according to which our human strivings should be oriented. In other words, it cannot tell us what we should live for, let alone what we should be willing to sacrifice for or die for. And second, science cannot do anything to relieve the weight of guilt on our souls. I come back to my guilt theme, a weight to which it has added appreciably precisely by its rendering us unable, excuse me, it's by its rendering us able to be in control of and therefore accountable for so many things, more and more elements in our lives, responsibility being the fertile seedbed of guilt. That growing weight seeks opportunities for release, seeks transactional outlets, but finds no obvious or straightforward ones in the purely secular dispensation. Instead, more often than not, we are left to flail about, seeking some semblance of absolution in an incoherent post-religious moral economy that has not entirely abandoned the notions and mechanism of sin, but lacks the ability to call it that name and lacks the transactional power of absolution or expiation, without which no moral system can be bearable. Hawthorne's stories, uh, needless to say, do not offer a solution to any of these problems, but they do present the problems with an uncanny brilliance and make us keenly aware of the moral perils of our own ever-growing power in the world. The version of New, early New England that he conjures in his stories turns out to be a distant mirror of our own dilemmas and as such tells us something profoundly true 
about ourselves and our current condition. And that is a lot for a 19th century author to have done. Thank you. If I could just ask you to unpack, to use a word that you used in your talk, um, this, this term Hebraic, oh, there's something that seems a bit, let's say pessimistic or even fateful in your use of this word. And it's funny because when I read Isaiah, specifically second Isaiah, the feeling that I come away with is hope. This, mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. beautiful kind of, maybe it's illusory, but I don't come away with more of a pessimistic understanding of kind of where we're going. And from what I remember from the Scarlet Letter, I don't think the ending, I know you didn't necessarily talk about it, but I don't think the ending was decidedly pessimistic either. So perhaps you could just yeah. Um, yeah. circle no, that, back to that. Well, that ending is very peculiar because we do have uh, um, Hester Prynne goes sort of back to England, then she comes back and she becomes this sort of prophetess. And it, it, uh, I, I, this is a little bit of a cop out, but I find all of that very super added and unconvincing. Um, if you think it, that contemporary is different or not. Oh. Well, I, I don't think that. It, Part of what I, I have been trying to say, and actually your question is a good way to bring this out, is that Hawthorne actually was conflicted about these things. I mean, there is a way in which Hester becomes a kind of Margaret Fuller-like figure in, in the very, very end. Uh, I think it's not the best part of the novel. It's not the most convincing part of the novel. Uh, uh, but, but it is there. And I think Hawthorne did um, struggle with a kind of, he was, he did have a spread eagle nationalist side. He was a Democrat and not a Whig. Um, you know, uh, he, he, uh, uh, it, it, um, uh, he, he was complicated that way. Uh, so I, I think he, he uh, shared in some of the uh, sort of, we'll call it optimism, of the pro sort of progressive optimism, small p, progressive optimism of his Set. But what I, where on, going on Isaiah, I think what, um, what I would say is, and I'm using a combination of Strauss and Matthew Arnold, two figures that are not necessarily held in high esteem in the academy these days, but, uh, but I'm, that, I'm kind of cobbling together a sense of Hebraism from that, that Hebraism, in, at least in literature, refers to uh, what one thinks about the ability of human beings and human intentionality to alter the conditions of human existence. And that the, 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 Hellen, the Hellenist, uh, Hellenism view, in going to Arnold's dichotomy, is very optimistic about that. Our, about the, and it's really continuous with the Enlightenment, that, that, that we have, uh, that we live in an intelligible world. And that the, 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 the secrets that other generations have thought were sort of removed from the possibility of our grasping them are in fact available to us. We can know everything. We can transform things. We can relieve man's estate by uh, the knowledge of nature that comes to us through science. Uh, and that the Hebraic view is more skeptical about A, about the possibility of that, and B, the consequences. You build the Tower of Babel and uh, you're, 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 you, the, the, the serpent in the garden. But, but, you also, what? but you also have this idea that God wants to destroy the world, and Noah, the presence of one sadiq, one righteous man, prevents him from doing it. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, indicates like an anti-apocalypse. Well, it, it's, 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 it's certainly an aspect, uh, something that you see in the Hebrew Bible that God um, has a sort of interactive relationship <laughs> with, with his people that is a little hard to explain uh, in any sort of rational terms. Uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know that I would conclude that, um, that um, God's sort of available for a transactional, you know, that's the art of the deal with God is, is a, <laughs> it's a Hebraic text. <laughs> I mean, certainly, I mean, and... and uh, and, and of course, the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, it, it kind of goes the other way, you know, and eventually one man was not enough. Uh, uh, yeah. I was going to add something to Sarah's question. I think Hebraic strain to me, I was expecting, and you did bring it up at one point, 
the political idea, Moses is liberator, liberation from slavery and law giving and that whole theme. So this idea of sin, really, original sin, I'm not, I think Hebraic is a sort of strange label. Well, it may be a Christianized uh, a, a, a understanding of, a, a, but certainly Strauss, Strauss's account of Jerusalem, I think, which, which emphasizes revelation. Uh, not so much sin, but, but the need for revelation. That there, are, right. there are things that we cannot know unless they are, they are revealed to us, are given to us, so and that, that they are beyond our power of cognition. One God's ways are not our... further on the basis of this lecture is the Matthew Arnold versus Strauss version of Athens of Jerusalem. Very interesting. That, well, that may be the next quite... project. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the prohibition on Adam and Eve of eating from the, the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil uh, um, is, a, is a not, another good example of this. That there is, and, and of course, the, 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 uh, the serpent plays the role of the revisionist historian in this. Uh, the serpent was the first revisionist historian. Uh, because the serpent says, did he tell you that? Oh, no, 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 that's not the right story. Let me, let me, let me redo the narrative for you. I'm liberally interpreting. I haven't read Hawthorne, but so many of the things you describe with Hawthorne stories and with the uh, Athens versus uh, Jerusalem, science versus uh, the heart, uh, so much seems to boil down to hubris on the part of humans. And I haven't heard you mention hubris as an underlying Oh, yeah, certainly. Here. So I wonder if you could ex expand on that. No, I think I think I, I think it's there. I didn't use the term. Uh, I, I actually didn't even use the term pride, but I could have and probably should have. Yes, it, it's. Uh, I mean, that's the the fatal. I mean, that's a, of course that's uh, uh, even though hubris is a Greek word, <laughs> so we have a problem saying it isn't Hellenic. But <laughs> uh, but in term in. Arnold's terms, in terms of his dichotomy, uh, which we, let's take it to be sort of ideal types and not descriptive of historical reality. Uh, uh, that, uh, and of course, Greek drama is full of this. You know, that people ambition. You know, they, they uh, Icarus flies too close to the sun. Uh, Oedipus. You know, there, we could go on and on with all the examples of of pride that go, goes before a fall, of uh, men who contend with the gods and, and lose. Uh, but I think for my Arnold's uh, 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 terminology, that, that, those would be Hebraic insights uh, um, and not Hellenic ones. Uh, again, that shows why we shouldn't be too wedded to the, this terminology. I, I just wanted to comment that I've read portions of the Hebrew Bible and the message that I get out of the majority of them is that if man obeys God, things will go well. And if man doesn't obey God, things are not going to go well. And I think there's one, one caveat, which is the book of Job, where uh, God says, where were you when I made the world, et cetera, and uh, that things are not quite that way. But that's the only place that I see it. Uh, is in the book of Job. Now you can the, say that I guess it's in Genesis, but uh, well, you know, in the end, uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to get into sort of rivaling interpretation of Job, but Job is a very um, <laughs> Hebraic in the Matthew Arnold sense book in the extreme because I mean it's basically, uh, you know, where were you? Uh, and it's a way of saying you know, you, you, your your insight, your intellection. Your, uh, your knowledge matters for nothing, nothing whatsoever. And uh, all you can do is re, you know, repent in ashes. And then, of course, he's restored. But uh, it, it is, it is uh, to the extent that you see the, the, the books of the Hebrew Bible as, as being in some way assembled to make a, a point, uh, I think the point of Job would be the, the utter incomprehensibility of God and of God's will. Uh, that, that's how I would that we read it. Yeah. 
No, that's, and that's why Job is such a, you know, this is why people like C.G. Jung just can't, can't quite get their heads around it because it does seem to stand out. What I've learned is that the Hebraic tradition has given us a moral civilization, and hence mankind has the opportunity to make decisions. And hence you make the wrong decisions, you suffer, but you have the opportunity to do well. Yeah, no, moral responsibility is certainly an important element of it. And, you know, you have, you have the law. The law is, uh, um, is not, well, I won't say but it's never ambiguous, but it's, it's, it, it is set down. But it's it not is, a sense it is of a, guilt. It's a sense of uh, going forward and opportunity to do well. Mm -hmm. I have read, and I can't remember where, so this is not a very... Um, scholarly question, but um, that the Puritans, we have sort of unfairly characterized them as being sort of joyless and dour. Oh, and I totally agree with wearing that. Wearing dark colors yeah. all the time, and that yes. most of that is really untrue. And um, I wonder if Hawthorne is partly responsible yes. for that view of the Puritans, and if we looked at the Puritans not through the lens of Hawthorne, how would they stack up with this Hebraic interpretation of history? Well, I, yes, I think it, that's, a, that's a very good question and a complicated one, but I would agree that Hawthorne, I, I think H.L. Mencken it, it, it should have a special place in the whatever, <laughs> the, lower, the lower place for his, uh, it, it, but it didn't start with him. It, 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 um, it, it certainly uh, is present in you know, in not just the Scarlet Letter, but in many other places. This, uh, and Hawthorne, I think, did have this sense of guilt about the family's association with the Salem trials and, and all of that. Um, uh, there is, you know, in the Scarlet Letter is, is uh, you know, the, 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 the moral vengefulness of Chillingworth, you know, the cuckolded husband, um, uh, is worse by a magnitude of you know, the nth degree than the sins of uh, Dimsdale and, and Hester. Uh, I mean, that's one of the points of the book, is that sort of vengeful, what we might call legalistic religion um, is, can take you to much, much worse places and much deeper forms of sin. And I, you know, that's, that's a, a good point, but I think um, he, he does, I think, if he's the only source <laughs> for uh, your information about Puritans. No, I think this has uh, been a long battle in American historiography. I mean, the American historians, people who've gone to graduate school in American history, I mean, they, they may have uh, a lot of things they disagree about, but I think pretty much everybody knows, ever since Perry Miller uh, did his magnificent studies of the New England mine, starting in, I think, the 1930s or 40s, but. Uh, he did it in two volumes. And then others, you know, Edmund Morgan, uh, you know, a long list of great American historians who have uh, affirmed, no, the Puritans, they didn't even dress in black all the time. They liked sex, you know, but not, you know, all over the place, you know. <laughs> they liked drinking, against not to excess, but they liked food, they liked festivals, you know. It's, it's not all the Maypole of Marymount. It, it's, it's, uh, so it is, it is, uh, and I think there's a lot of really good scholarship uh, on the subject. Unfortunately, none of it has filtered out really into public perception uh, that to be a Puritan is uh, to be you know, sort of rep repressive, legalistic, uh, unforgiving, et cetera. Um, to the point now, I, I see things about the new Puritanism on college campuses where you can't utter certain words, you can't... Uh, Say certain ideas. I want to say, wait a minute. We're we're kind of way out on the limb here. Let's let's just climb back to the trunk and get off this limb. But so I would love to see happen. You know, it has happened somewhat in the the church world that people discovered, for example, the devotional um, literature of Puritanism, uh, and uh, uh, it helps if they know a little bit more about what, how Puritanism arose in the context of the history of the Church of England and all of that, but people don't, they only trouble themselves to know that. I think it's a very rich 
resource. Miller uh, also, by the way, in, in the first volume of the New England Mind, he argues, and nobody, I think, can really refute this, that there was only a slightest bit of difference between Puritan theology and the sort of mainstream of Anglican theology, and indeed even Roman Catholicism. I mean, church polity was something else, but uh, anyway, it's a great question, uh, and uh, I can give you some names of some scholars to read, but unfortunately nobody else is reading them <laughs> other than academics. Uh, I'm wondering whether you would be open to uh, the idea that Hawthorne as you've presented him, uh, isn't uh, to some great degree uh, an Athenian uh, in that to the extent that he is opposing something like willful blindness, uh, wanting to uh, compel self-knowledge and let's say specifically historical self-knowledge on the part of the people that he thinks otherwise will uh, remain with the veil over its head. Yeah. So it looks to me as if uh, there's a sense in which you've presented a Hellenist or an Athenian mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in depicting Hawthorne as you have. And I'm just curious whether... That's whether a very thoughtful, have... that's a very thoughtful question. And uh, uh, I, I, think, I think something like the case you are describing can be made. I, I would have trouble seeing it that way just because Hawthorne is so... Um, obsessed with, well, he's obsessed with obsession. He's obsessed with uh, secrets and, and the, the human propensity for secrets. He's very secretive himself. Um, and uh, that uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, one of his stories that I didn't talk about. And, 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 it, and it's, it's really kind of a ghoulish story called Wakefield. And the story is goes like this, that, that man gets up, you know, leaves the house, goes on a trip, sort of business trip, <laughs> and, uh, and decides uh, to come back to the town, but not to come home. And he lives in the same town with his wife, but um, never comes home, and never reveals to her that his, he has returned home. It's a, but he observes her, he kind of stalks her, um, and watches her grow old. I mean, it is the most misogynistic story I, as I read it. I, not everybody reads it that way, but uh, uh, imaginable. And what you see is the ma a man in the grip of, of a psychological compulsion that, that um, is, is very hard to understand uh, and hard to um, imagine how you could parse it out and, uh, and, and place it into categories of not rational behavior, but just even intelligible behavior. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of his work that, that is like that, especially these short works, which are almost like uh, uh, thematic essays on particular examples of human obsession. Um, uh, so I, I, I think he is, um, uh, he, he's, he's open to, Enlightenment kinds of insights into, um, yeah, he's he, he's not a, a believer, for example. He never quite can accept sort of even even a kind of rather near beer Unitarianism. He never really can go that far. But he thinks there's something about the doctrine of original sin, uh, although he he wants to he doesn't want to call it original sin. Uh, but there's something about that doctrine of original sin that captures a reality about. Uh, human existence. And, and while there's nothing, you know, uh, especially, well, I would say especially Jewish about the, the idea of original sin, and even like Orthodox Christians don't accept, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians don't accept the concept that I think there is in this context something extremely Hebraic 
about it because it represents a kind of an innate, inherent limitation on us that, 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 uh, that we cannot be as God. Uh, that, that, that's, for, that, that's foreclosed to us forever by our natures. Um, uh, so, well, I, I also think there's a kind of uh, compassionate, um, I hate to use this word, but almost therapeutic side to him, a sense that if we could understand ourselves better, if we could understand our hearts better, I think that's what you're getting at. Um, we, we could at least not bring all this pain on ourselves. Um, but he doesn't uh, really see it as a soluble problem, this problem of the heart uh, that he talks about. You um, mentioned that uh, the Puritans wanted to build a city on the hill, and they felt that, which is Jerusalem, and that uh, they were working toward that. And I just wonder if Salem was that Jerusalem, after all, Jerusalem. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, did yeah. this have a religious significance to Hawthorne or to anybody else? Well, let me, yeah, uh, hmm, oh. uh, um, yeah, he, he, he would not have signed on with that uh, sort of messianism uh, about, uh, about Massachusetts Bay. And that, I think, was part of what his work was to say, look at all this, you know. Although, of course, <laughs> one way of reading the Hebrew Bible is to say, these people are our patriarchs? I mean, <laughs> Jacob? I mean, come on. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it's also worth going back to where the city on the hill came from. Um, it, it, it really goes back to John Winthrop's sermon in 1630. Uh, 29 or 30, I can't remember, yeah, it was 30, uh, 1630, Bef aboard the Arbella before she landed at what would become Boston, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And uh, this was a, this, it's called the Model of Christian Charity, the sermon. It's a great, one of the great documents of early American history. And uh, he, what he's doing is reminding everybody, okay, you know, here we are, we finally made it. Um, there's a lot of people on board who are not necessarily uh, on board with the religious mission. And he's reminding everybody, this is what we're here for. This is, uh, we are here, we are on a commission from God, you know, to create this, this, this plantation, as they call it, a colony. And that, um, that we're, we're to be bound together. He, he uh, has this Pauline language about being bound together as one person. And it's very beautiful, but they said, then he says, and he, the city on the hill, of course, comes from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Uh, um, and, but he's, so he's citing this scripture that they all know, uh, and uh, we shall be a city on the hill. Uh, and, uh, and then goes on to say, if we fail, you know, it's not just on us. It, it, I mean, we will fail. It will be on all professors, as he calls it, of religion, not professors in the sense I am, but those who profess. Uh, um, so it's a kind of uh, a world historical mission in a way that, that uh, he's putting forward. Um, uh, I talk about this a little bit in Land and Hope and, and, and just because it's an illustration of how fervent they're. Can you imagine? It's sort of like going to Mars in the, and, and saying, okay, we're here. I, uh, <laughs> I'm doing God's work here and the eyes of all the world are upon me. No, oh, you're in Mars, buddy. It, 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 nobody's watching. Uh, they, he, they were at the furthest reach of the world beyond the known world for most of the people that, they, that were part of their reference group. So um, that's an indication of just how fervent their, their faith was that they were doing this thing. I think by the time, you know, Puritanism had really faded by the end of the 17th century. Uh, Jonathan Edwards kind of brings it back. Great Awakening, but it, 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 it's, it's definitely something that has a sort of finite period in the history of New England. Uh, by the time Hawthorne, Hawthorne clearly inherits some of it. And that's, I think, a lot of Hawthorne scholarship is just how much did he inherit. And uh, uh, it's hard to measure. But um, he wasn't one himself, but he was felt connected to all of it. I don't know whether I'm answering your question, but I think the, 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 the one of the interesting things about the city on the hill thing, which is now part of our 
political rhetoric. And that's not at all. I mean, they, John Winthrop, the United States of America, what, what is that? <laughs> that has nothing to do with what he was, the context in which he actually said those words. And uh, there's a lot of scholars who think um, that the idea was to have this sort of pure instantiation of the Christian church without the, all the errors of Rome and Canterbury, but uh, a, a pure restoration of the apostolic church, which is what a lot of Protestantism has been about over the years. Um, that, that that would sort of stay there and kind of like, like, like hold the course until everything went to hell or heck <laughs> back in the old country, and then they could kind of come back in and restore things in the image of this pure church. So that they, 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 they weren't, in, in their own minds, settlers in a permanent way. Um, you wouldn't say this about Virginia or other colonies, but you, but you might argue, as some people have, that this could be true for New England. It's an interesting argument. I don't know what I think about it. But, but it, it, they definitely are uh, thinking in terms of uh, having influence back where they came from. Um, exactly how, it's hard to say, but uh, they did have that in their minds. Do we know when and what Hawthorne read of the Greeks? The tragedies, the uh, 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 Plato, Aristotle, uh, was it all Latins? I mean, presumably in college oh, yeah, he read Dante. some. Dante did not know Greek literature. Of uh, Dante, you know, it's the reason that uh, Ulysses is such a, a, a scoundrel in uh, in the Divine Comedy. Is he didn't know he didn't know anything about other depictions of and most of the depictions of Ulysses are nasty in, in the classical because they're in Latin, you know anyway yeah. Uh, it's, so, it's, so what Greek study did Hawthorne? Oh. Did Hawthorne read? In other words, was it in the curriculum at Bowdoin? Was it? Uh, yeah, uh, I think so. And, and in those ten years, was he reading Greeks or just? Hutchinson. You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it can be found. I mean, as you know, there, there are dozens of biographies of Hawthorne that looked at everything. Uh, yeah, I, but I'm sure he had e exposure to Homer. Uh, uh, beyond that, I'm not sure, but I'm, I, would, I would feel fairly sure that he had exposure to the Homeric literature. Um, beyond that, I. I'm even guessing and saying that, but I feel confident about it. It's a great question. I have one last question. How come we don't have more scary Halloween movies based on Hawthorne stories? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, some of the movies are pretty bad. Uh, you know, uh, there's a version of the Scarlet Letter that has Demi Moore as, uh, as uh, uh, Hester Prynne, and that is pretty scary. Uh, <laughs> You talked about scary movies. I've got a scary question. Uh, you've been talking about a lot of dichotomies in, in the world in America. Uh, could you reflect just briefly about the dichotomous situation in the United States today? Uh, I, to I told yeah. you that would be a scary question. <laughs> I, think, I think we need a third category. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, no, I, I, I don't know where to begin with that. Maybe we could talk afterward about this, but I, it, it, in the context of this, I think, look, I think uh, uh, the one thing I would say, and I, I think I kind of alluded to this in the lecture toward the end, is that I think we are dealing as a culture with um, the, the problem of uh, guilt, sense of moral responsibility, whether it's things like the environment, uh, the history, historical sins, you know, the, the issue of reparations that comes up uh, quite a bit. This, this came up in the New York Times 1619 project. You know, we're dealing with the problem, how do, how, do you make, how do you make amends for these things? How do you, uh, the environmental one I think is even more powerful because you can't sort of make reparations to <laughs> the environment uh, uh, and maybe that's not even a proper way to think about it. But how do you, um, uh, you know, we, we exist in the world. Let me get really uh, cosmic about it. I mean, we exist in the world 
by, as organic beings, by consuming the life of other organisms. Uh, it's f even plants. Uh, these are living things. So we, take, we don't take inorganic things into our bodies. We take organic things. We, we eat them. We kill them. <laughs> I killed an onion today. We kill them. Uh, we, we metabolize them. We eliminate them. So there's a kind of, uh, if you really want to have, as some of my students do, have an extremely high-pitched sense of moral responsibility. You know, it, your very existence. You know, I'm taking up space. I'm, I'm leaving carbon footprint everywhere I go. And, um, and no, look, I, I actually, this is a serious matter, because I, I mean, I do see this in some of my most morally alive students are very alive to these kinds of things. How can I live in the world in which uh, there's, that I'm not guilty in some way? Uh, I'm pardon me? Well, yeah, although there is atonement. The thing is you have to also have a sort of metaphysical system within which, and a, and a worldly system within which those uh, atoning acts or restoration of right relation with the deity can be accomplished. And if you have a sort of post-religious society, You've, uh, you've ruled all those things out. So where, where do you go from that? that that's, I, look, I, that doesn't explain the 2016 election. I, I'm not, not going <laughs> to, I hope you weren't looking for a political, but I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a dilemma that, that and, and that people, um, I can, even people I strongly disagree with, um, I can see there's a way in which they're, uh, they're working out their salvation with fear and trembling. They are, they are um, and, and very bad tools, but they're the tools they have. Uh, so I, I think, I, you know, look at, um, to get a little bit into politics, not our politics, but Germany's politics. Look at the, 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 uh, the way that Germany, um, and not le any less in the last five years than in the years since 1945 has been um, so much under the weight of unexpatiated sin, uh, of, of national sins. And uh, no nation in history, and I'm not, here's an apologist for Germany, but uh, no, no nation in history has done more uh, to expiate. You could say they've, no nation has done worse things, uh, and that, that might be an arguable point. But uh, at what point is, has enough been done? Um, do they have to sort of live in a perpetual state of, uh, of imploring forgiveness from the world? Uh, that, well, they won't. But it, it, and that's a frightening thought if it comes in the wrong way. So, does that help? I mean, I, 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 that, I, I see through my that. own, you know, guilt-colored glasses. <laughs> but I told you he was a cheerful man to yes. bring us into these yes. dark depths. Yes. Thank you very much, Bill. This was a really stimulating. Uh, well, thank you all evening. for coming. Thank and, you all and for coming. Stick it with me. Thank you very much.